It's been a bunch of questions that have been answered, but I'll kind of go through some of them just to see if there's any discussion or answers from further, or further answers from some of the panelists. Um, one of the questions that have, was first asked was, what about like salts in liquid manure? Are those typically evaluated on crop yields and things like that? Uh, so far, Glenn answered no. I know here in Minnesota, and it's probably similar to you in Ohio, Glenn, is that we have enough rainfall to move salts out of the topsoil things that not too many of our growers are looking at salts, but I know that's certainly an issue in drier uh, climates. Um, anyone else have any comments on that one? Follow or please. Yeah, uh, we'll certainly look at uh, salt index or soluble salts in the fertilizer. Um, maybe less so in a uh, field uh, application, but certainly in container applications, um, it can be a very big deal. Uh, I think for crops, uh, like field crops, there's no, no big issues. Um, a lot of the excessive salts can, can be leached out with the rainfall. And, and most of the issues would be sodium, um, and that will easily flush down with rainfall water. Uh, I would be concerned if that would be used under, for example, a high tunnel or some other uh, condition where there's not a lot of rainfall. And then you definitely want to keep an eye on the salt buildup because that could start limiting crop, crop growth and production. Great. I guess the question for Paulo and Blaze would be how energy intensive is the process of making organominal fertilizers and is it cost effective? It looks like Paulo, you already answered that um, generally pretty cost effective as long as the manure prices are low. Yes, yes. Glenn, what do you think? I mean, Blaze. Yeah, so. Um... I would say yes, it can be energy intensive. Um, you know, we certainly use uh, our share of diesel fuel in the turning process and, and trucking the material, um, as well as shipping shipping uh, to the end user. Uh, we also do use, um, of course, electricity as well as some natural gas in the dehydration process. Um, so there are uh, um, certainly a large amount of energy used. Um, but it, it, we do certainly find it cost effective as well. Um, we don't do, you know, a large volume of, material, of product with conventional growers under the, the current uh, economic climate. Um, but uh, for organic growers, uh, it's very cost effective. Um, but going back to the, to the application rates and application methods, it, uh, by composting the material and granulating it and, and creating um, an easily applied product, we're able to put it down at a very low rate, right in row with the seed, um, which you know makes it uh, much more cost effective. Yeah, there's always pros and cons to everything. Uh, another question was about pathogens on human and human consumption when we're applying these to um, crops is there what happens to those in the extrusion process I believe they're pretty much killed because it gets pretty hot with drying and then through the extrusion process yeah so uh, pathogens are killed during the composting process um, and then we have a further heat treatment process at, at uh, after composting we do the the dehydration at a relatively low temperature because we don't want to kill the beneficial microorganisms uh, but we certainly have to monitor both the, the uh, compost material as well as the finished product for pathogens um, in order for uh, growers to be able to apply it direct to edible food crops. But there's uh, no restrictions on applying a composted manure if it has gone through um, a verifiable pathogen reduction system. And so, uh, whereas you're not allowed to apply a raw manure onto an edible crop within 360 days of harvest, I believe. Composted uh, material that's gone through a heat treatment process can be applied right up until harvest. Yeah, and I think for, for the other process, the one I described, the temperatures are fairly high. So 125 Celsius at 100 PSI, that will likely destroy 
and the pathogens. Just the spores, I, I don't know. I think it's still enough pressure and temperature to uh, inactivate any spores that would be present. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, and like I said, uh, it, depending on where this is going in the U.S., I know that the regulations are pretty, pretty clear forward. So if this is to be used for food production of produce, then there would have to be some uh, data that shows what, what's live and what's dead in these materials. Someone has an interesting question. Has anyone ever worked with biochar when mixing the manures? Yeah, we do use some biochar. We, we, we will blend biochar into our fertilizers on occasion, um, generally at customer's request. Um, biochar can be, again, difficult to apply and uh, sometimes due to cost is applied at very uh, relatively low rates. And so um, by adding it to a, a fertilizer, you're able to kind of bulk it up and, and get it in more of a, a spreadable form. So we do, we do do some of that. We've seen mixed results. I think it comes down to the quality of the biochar. Um, it, it can have a detrimental effect. Um, and it can have a very positive effect. Yes, I've heard of instances when biochars, if they're not kind of impregnated with nutrients, they can actually kind of take up the nutrients and hold them and keep them from your crops instead of releasing them. So it certainly, I agree totally that it really depends on the quality of the biochar. Uh, we'll keep on with some questions. Let's see. Glenn. A uh, gentleman said he must have missed your intro, but why did you blend UAN as opposed to, and manure as opposed to applying the two products separately? Is there a benefit to that? Basically, we, want, we wanted to see if uh, what would happen when we did combine uh, the manure and the UAN. Um, we expected it would simply bump the uh, nutrient content of the manure, but we weren't sure. And to, to combine the two was just an effort to save a second trip across the field with a 28% UAN applicator at a later time. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. I think there was a bunch of questions, or still some open questions. Let's look at those. Um, how do how would you think surface applied pelleted or granulated fertilizers compare to liquid manure in the face of the heavy rain events that we've been having in the in the region recently? Well, I think that um, when you put a granulated manure fertilizer down, uh, that's going to take a lot of water to dissolve that fertilizer and for that to move. Whereas if you put a liquid manure fertilizer down, that's already all dissolved. So any water that comes, depending on what's happening, it could already start moving that, that nutrient source. Whereas for the pellet, it first has to dissolve. Uh, so I would say... Right. It, it depends. If you're, you're if you're talking about a three inch rain event, then yeah, a lot of manure is gonna is gonna move with water. Whereas for the pellet, only what can be dissolved would move with that water. Um, what do you think, Glenn? You do a lot more of the liquid manure use. You probably well, have a different perspective. On the liquid, just speaking on the liquid side, if you compare liquid manure to commercially available fertilizer, uh, Iowa State's done quite a bit of research on that and. Liquid manure usually is going to have somewhere around 20% of the phosphorus in the dissolvable form. And then the majority of it's in more of an organic phosphorus form. So it will become available, but it's not readily available immediately. So believe it or not, after, after an application event, uh, when it does rain, uh, Iowa State got more off of the commercial fertilizer than they did the liquid manure applied fields. But I would think in a pelleted form, I would think that would be a little more stable yet. So so, you know, I would be all for that. We're just, in our, in our systems that we work with in Ohio with our liquid manure, there's just so much volume of liquid there. You hate to have to haul it, you hate to have to move it because it costs money. But right now we're just looking at the best ways we can use the liquid manure. Great, thank you. There's a question for Blaze. Do you ever have trouble with your turkey litter when rose catching fire? Apparently there's an egg layer facility in Arizona that does rotary dryer for drying and then compost outdoors and they usually have smoking or can have smoking piles occasionally. 
Yeah, we, we don't have that problem. We don't have issues with combustion. Uh, we turn our windrows regularly, so we will turn them uh, at least once per week, and that helps regulate the temperature. Uh, it prevents them from overheating. We also monitor the moisture level, so we will add water um, as the piles heat up, they, they burn off the moisture and dry out and we'll add uh, inject water into those rolls, rows to keep them about 40 to 50 percent um, water content. And so no, we don't don't have the overheating. I know it, it can be quite difficult to compost egg layer litter or egg layer manure. There's often no carbon source. If it's uh, caged layer manure especially, then there's uh, no bedding and no carbon source and um, you know if the piles are left um, unturned stagnant uh, they can go anaerobic and overheat great so I think this is probably the last question we'll take because we are running a little bit over time here but there's a good number of people staying on so thank you um, Paul and Blaze what assumptions do you use for availability of nitrogen in the first year with the products you use So um, we count the majority of the nitrogen available in the first year. Uh, the composting process converts the nitrogen in, in different ways. And so it does uh, take the immediately available ammoniacal nitrogen and change it to slow release organic nitrogen. Uh, but the microorganisms will also break down um, the organic nitrogen that's uh, bound up in long carbon chains. And so it will take uh, a nitrogen that's typically not going to be available in the first year and make it more readily available. And so when we've done, it's, it's obviously very difficult to study in a field environment, but when we've done lab studies on it, we'll see approximately 80% of the nitrogen uh, release within the first one growing season. Um, and then of course, you know, the amount of moisture, um, and temperature is going to have a big impact on that as well. Uh, but we generally, um, we call our products about a 45-day release. Um, so it's about a 6 to 10-day uh, release to get about, a 6 to 10-week release to get about 80% of the nitrogen uh, out of the material.